And today I have a very special guest, Tim Pastor. How are you doing? Did I pronounce your name right? Yeah, that's fine. That's correct. Good evening. Hey, thanks for uh, thanks for having me. And that's great. And you're a bit of an expert when it comes to reputation systems. We were talking the other day on the interwebs on Twitter about the fake news and how to read articles. And I hear you've got a lot to say about it. Uh, yeah, definitely. I'm always happy to share my opinion, as you might know from Twitter. So all questions are welcome. Yeah, yeah. We, you and I have had some some interaction going back now, you know, about maybe two, three years, I guess, and to do with identity systems on the blockchain and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think it started around 2014 somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and I followed your work on ProTip, uh, which is also somewhat not really related to identity, but we can get into that later. Yeah. Um, so but yeah, definitely. So it's nice to uh, finally have the time to have a chat. No, it's really, really good. And also joined by Shinobi. How are you doing? Hello from some random place that's not where I'm usually at. Hello. And thanks for taking the effort, actually, to join us, because that's been, it's, we missed you. We missed you when you weren't here. It wasn't quite the same. And Rick, uh, who I should also say, uh, Rick is uh, the guy responsible for all our online imagery. So thanks very much, Rick, for all your effort. No problem. Hey, guys. How are y'all doing? Yeah, real talent there. And from one talent to the other, also have my girlfriend, Janine, in, in, here to give us the depth and the background on the stories. Hi, everyone. Yeah. All right. So let's go. Let's let's talk about how we even got to this kind of this, this show in the in the first place. We were kind of arranging this, and that's because uh, Tim often has a, you know a tendency to tweet out stuff that I really enjoy and I really like. And this was really to do with China banning Bitcoin, which we can give you some more depth on today in its continuation. But when reading this Wall Street Journal article, I just love the way that you highlighted that there were no you know, credible sources like analysts and investors say, didn't respond to a request for comment, said the people, said one of the people, analysts say, the people said, said one person. You've done a really good job on this, man. Well, tell us a little bit more about the point you were trying to get across. Um, well, I, I didn't highlight it myself. Um, it was somebody, somebody else, um, another fellow Bitcoiner from the Netherlands who pointed it out and pointed it out to me. Um, so it just came from image or, or whatever you call it. Um, so I figured it really nicely highlighted, you know, how you should actually read an article. And as you can see, um, in one of my comments after that, I thought it was kind of funny how people responded to it because most people responded like, um, oh, look at this, this is crappy journalism instead of like, oh, you know, people don't even take the time to properly read something to compare their sources, etc. Um, so I literally tweeted like how to read <laughs> an article um, with those highlights that somebody else did. Um, and the responses to it were, were like exactly the opposite of what you would expect, you know, at least in my opinion. So I'm curious for your thoughts on it. Why were they the opposite of what you expected? Um, because when you when you look at it, what it says, it's like um, some people say, some analysts say, and that's that's probably nineteen percent of the news. So when you look at the news by mainstream media, it's always some analyst or some expert, or but at the end of the day, they're just random people on the internet, or so to speak. Um, only because they, they wear this label of like a Wall Street Journal or some other publication, um, people tend to give it more weight. But in my opinion, at the end of the day, they're all people who try to write down, you know, whatever they've heard and they share that. And then people take it a little bit. They don't really take it out of context, but they emphasize that it's shitty news. Well, yeah, but that goes for like most of the news, um, in my opinion, at least. So. I don't understand why, pe why people always make such a big fuss out of news, while if you actually read what it says and compare your sources, then it's fairly easy to figure out that there's not really much going on. Yeah, and as um, Ian Grigg, uh, our mutual friend, pointed out, it kind of fits the Bitcoin non-mainstream media press as well, right? Um, that essentially, that I think the point you're making is that we have bad news because people don't question the news that they're given. So there's no incentive really for the media to produce anything of any better quality because people are dissatisfied with the headlines, you know? Right. 
And um, like I, I didn't have a really long school uh, school career. I dropped out when I was 16. But um, what I do remember really well was the first lesson in history class. And that's why they told us that you always have to compare your sources. And that's one of the things that always stuck with me, that whatever you read, go around, compare your sources, ask questions. And it's the hard thing about it is that it will leave you with more questions than answers in a lot of cases, especially where it comes to um, like subjects like North Korea that we're going to discuss, or um, when you look at conspiracy theories, you know, sometimes you, it's not that hard to figure out that there's some truth to it, you know, or that there are a lot of questions, but once you start digging into it, you will just be left with more questions instead of answers, at least as my experience. Um, so if you read something and you try to purvey that you actually know a lot about something, at least try to compare some source, uh, some sources and just always stay curious, never think that you know the truth. Like whenever I see somebody saying, this is the truth, I'm already done with it because you cannot have an argument with those people because they're not willing to listen, at least in my yeah. experience. Yeah, it's, it's their truth. It's right. their perspective, which everyone thinks they're right. I mean, that's that's the whole point. Of course. <laughs> Anyone else want to jump in here real quick? I'm, I'm as flawed as, as everybody else. Yeah. So I I'm think, not no, blaming no, other people. It's just an observation. That's See, a really good point. Self-awareness is key here, right? To jump in real quick, like I think something that everybody should at least do some cursory reading on is Bayesian logic. And that that's where you actually come to a couple different probable explanations and you weight them accordingly to the likelihood they're correct. So instead of just coming to a, an absolute conclusion and then thinking this is the truth now, you always try to keep in mind the different possible answers and their relative uh, likelihoods of, of explaining something. So you think in, in potential as opposed to the absolute um, answers, you know what I mean? Yeah, I think that's a good way of describing it. Couldn't have said it better myself. Right, and I want to also talk about how the fact that we outsource our trust to these large institutions really threads into some of the work that, that you know Tim and I have been sort of working on. I think you've been a little bit more proactive than me. I did this project back in 2014 called World Citizen ID, which was really just a little hack that I put up on GitHub to show demonstrate people a protocol that could be used. Uh, mostly because I wanted people to see how it kind of worked under the hood. But when we're talking about, I don't want to be crass and just talk about like identity on the blockchain because that's just really naff. But what we can talk about is the reputation systems that can be built around that, which I think is way more interesting. Because rep reputation is an old saying um, in Nigeria that your reputation is worth more than a bar of gold. And it's easily, you know, it's hard to acquire, but it's very easily lost. And I think that online now, reputation as a form of capital is starting to outpace money in some senses. Like if you've got a really good Twitter account, social media account with a large following and good engagement metrics, that account is worth something to somebody. We hear the term often now like influencers, right? Who are we watching now? Louis Cole, right? Louis Cole, Jeanine, and he's going around the world and he keeps saying, well, you know, I'm going to meet up with a key influencer in this area who's going to tell me all about Greenland. And it's like, I cringe because I just think, oh, it's just Web 2.0 language. But we do outsource our trust to these to these influencers, right? Whether it's mainstream media or whether it's someone like Louis Cole, because as we saw yesterday with Charlie Lee talking about how, you know, these Chinese exchanges, you know, there was truth to, to these Chinese exchanges being shut down by the authorities. His saying that apparently caused the market to react, it triggered a market event. And then he was forced to kind of respond to all these people saying, oh, hey, I lost money because of what you said. And I think it's because, you know, people like Charlie Lee and also Charlie Shrem, we've seen it too in Bitcoin. When they open their mouths, it automatically becomes a news event just because everybody trusts them. Charlie's have superpowers. Yeah, but it's not just him though, is it? There's other people too, we've seen, uh, uh, Phil Potter from Bitfinex and the company that I work at, you know, he goes on to TeamSpeak, he says something in a conversation with Flipper, and then next thing we know, it's up on Reddit, and then everyone's upvoting it, and it's getting a whole bunch of traction. And so these influencers, so-called influencers, trigger market events. It, I'm saying it has real economic capital, 
And Alan de Botton, actually, one of my favorite modern philosophers, uh, popular philosophers, I would say, it said said it quite well that you know, in you know, thousands of years ago when we were tribal, you probably wanted to be famous enough, but not too famous, right? You want to be so famous that everyone knows you because then you could become a potential target. But you definitely want to be known because that reputation uh, is fungible. It can be exported. You can actually use it and trade it for goods and, and borrow things. And I want to give everyone in the notes, in the show notes here, we've got a primer to web reputation systems from all the way back in 2010. Feels like yesterday to me, but I read this great book called Building Web Reputation Systems. And you don't have to be a developer to understand it, though it will go into some technical detail. And um, Randy Farmer was one of the authors and he gave a really good talk at Google. And so if you want to learn a little bit more, I think we've moved on a bit, Hayton, um, from when this book was written. But this book basically follows Flickr. If you remember the, the image sharing website, of course, everyone moved over to Facebook after that. But Flickr had a really, really good reputation system uh, because a lot of it, part of it was public, part of it was private. You were able to upload images and potentially get your image featured as picture of the day on Flickr.com. And that was a big deal back in those days. Um, and it was really about, there's a lot of community. There was a lot of people that had hobbies that would put their images into categories and folders into subgroups, and then people would be able to follow those groups, and then you'd be able to comment on the photo. So what you would have is like a really good picture of a sunset or, or like a bird photo. And not only would photography fans like it or just regular people like it, but also, you know, bird watchers would, would get in there. And then you have this really interesting kind of what's called heterophilia, which is a love of difference. Lots of different people coming in from different places to comment on 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 the image, and unfortunately, you know, Flickr's kind of you know it still exists, but I think Yahoo basically sunset it. But they built some really really good algorithms where the user didn't know what information Flickr were using to upvote these photos. So there was some there was a black box behind behind the scenes. Tim, I mean, how far do you think we've come since that book was written? Um, we've come quite a long way. Um especially over the last couple of years. And uh, first of all, I'm personally not a really big fan of the idea of putting identity on the blockchain. I never really have been um, for several reasons. There's also people out there who actually have good ideas on how to potentially mix the two, um, you know, to make sure to make sure that your identity isn't revealed to the rest of the world, etc. But in my opinion, if you put something like that on a blockchain where identity becomes a pointer and in computer space, identity is always a pointer. So like with money, like with Bitcoin, um, for thousands of years, people have discussed on what the definition of money is. And the same goes for identity. But if you look in computer space, it's always a pointer. So that makes it like really easy as a starting point to start understanding those systems. Um, but if you put those pointers on a public network and either, even if you encrypt them, they're on a public network and maybe in 20 years, somebody figures out a way to reverse that, whatever, to link data, to correlate things. Um, so that's why I'm really skeptical about it. Um, for the rest, there have been so many developments because of all the people who are working on it. And I, I don't have a crystal ball either, so I don't know what the perfect solution is. I don't know if there's like a silver bullet to the whole thing. Um, but what I do love is that there are so many people out there working on the idea, trying to wrap their head around it. Um, yeah, and I'm really happy to help, you know, share my own ideas, listen to other people and, um, yeah, hopefully we'll get there one day because I do believe in the importance of decentralizing identity systems and maybe reputation systems even more. I've said this out loud a couple of times lately that reputation systems rule our physical world and people don't really realize that. But when you look at um, Google, Twitter, Facebook, Uber, eBay, Amazon, you name it, you know, they're all reputation systems. Without reputation systems, you would have a bunch of information that you would have to sift through, like before Alta Vista, where you had just, where you had directories of HTML pages and everybody would add, or they, you would just continue adding links to that. So as a result, what you want, you have this pile of data and instead of curating it, you want to make it searchable. Um, and now we get to a point where we have social networks that are so big that have first, second, third degree connections. Um, information is massive. The amount of information that flows through your computer nowadays. Um, I mean, look just what comes rolling down your timeline 
within an hour, mm -hmm. and that's probably more news than you've ever than you would have seen in uh, a week, maybe a month in the '80s or so. Um, so yeah, these systems are really important, and when you look at the power they have, um, I think it's it's good to con even consider them as critical infrastructure because we use them all day long. And the thing is, people never really think about how they can be misused because it's also fairly easy to misuse them. But when something is being censored from there or if they present you uh, different information, so if they want to influence political opinions, for example, it's really hard to figure out that they're actually doing that because yeah. they control the algorithms. It's all centralized. And that's why I think it's important to start thinking about decentralizing those things. And then what you were talking about earlier, like when you look at a tribal system, everybody had their own skills. Um, so it was fairly easy. You lived in a small town, everybody knew each other. Um, everything was geodesic. So if I wanted to deliver a message to you, I would walk over to your hut. I would say, brah, I would turn around 180 and walk in a straight line back to my own hut. Um, and then when we invented agriculture, had food surpluses, we started building cities. When we started building cities, we introduced the messenger because it was a lot more efficient to have one person run through the city than having, having everybody run through the city all the time to deliver a message on the other end of the town. Um, so that's where intermediaries were introduced. So now we're talking like 10,000 BC with the invention of agriculture. And then if we go all the way to, what is it, the 19... 40s i think that the micro transistor mm -hmm. was invented at bell labs world war, yeah world war one i think was a massive early. yeah yeah tesla even had a patent for something similar in 1895 i believe if i'm correct um so but but still it's like 10,000 years of first you have tribes then you have 10,000 years of people routing information by hand um by sail on horse etc um and then we suddenly have the micro transistor and CPUs, and now we can automatically switch information and route it directly from one person to another again without necessarily needing an intermediary. Um, while you're always dependent on like hardware manufacturers, uh, probably your ISP, etc. cetera. Um, but if you drill it down to the bare essentials, you could technically decentralize it. And it's becoming more efficient to do those kind of things to make connections more direct. So that's what I find interesting. And that's where I'm looking at when looking at decentralizing those things. Even around the early 1900s, um, people were trying lamps, you know, in, in, you know, hundreds of miles apart and then flashing the lamps and using Morse code and various techniques to try and transmit information across a, a wide space. It didn't really catch on because of the latency issue. Um, but come to think of it, I mean, if somebody had come up um, with uh, HTTP back then and uh, mm -hmm. all the online protocols, you could actually, uh, TCP, sorry, TCP, UDP, you could have done that, you know, back then. <laughs> it would have been very painful, True. but you could have done, um, even with the, that, that technology back then. You, you can mind, you, yeah, you, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but you can also mine Bitcoins by hand. So uh, that was, yeah, that was the point. What I also said earlier, I think it was before the show that, Bitcoin was impossible 10 years before it was invented. Uh, most people didn't even have internet at home, let alone you know yeah. the disk space or bandwidth to process that kind of data. I mean, the yeah, raw, well, don't the forget the uh, telegraph, guys. I mean, like that we got like most of the the circuit design that led to computers out of basic systems like that. But I, th I think the main problem with, with a system like a telegraph wire, though, was it, it could relay the information perfectly fine in an automated way. But there was no way to actually filter things without that person. Because you, you could have that automated relay that just blindly kept things moving down the line, but you actually had to put a person there if mm -hmm. you wanted to, say, filter out any noise or actually like weight information in its accuracy or integrity. Right, so just to finish that up, um, like what I was saying before, that, that that's my point that from the invention of the intermediary till the moment that the microtransistor was invented, there was always a human switching that information, like uh, the image of people behind switchboards uh, with phones. And it was actually AT&T who got a monopoly on the telephone network in the US on one condition. And that was that they had to provide everybody in the US with, uh, with a telephone connection or a landline connection 
Um, that was the only condition for them to get the monopoly. And then they did the calculation for themselves and they figured out like, oh, but that means that we probably need around 100 people, uh, sorry, 100 million people behind switchboards if we want to connect everybody to the telephone network. And so they had an incentive to invest in technology that allowed for the automatic switching of information. So um, they invested a lot of money in Bell Labs. And the funny thing there, the, the, the most ironic part is that the, the micro transistor sort of like broke up their monopoly. Um, it breaks down information silos in, into smaller and smaller bits. Um, so that's we're at a super interesting point in history here because it's only a few decades back and now we've we've had Bitcoin for less than a decade, internet at home for less than two decades. Um, mm -hmm. It's super interesting to be right in the middle of it. Yeah, it really is. And I think this sort of speaks a lot to these these big centralized uh, companies like you cite um, AT&T and in the UK we have um, BT, British Telecom. And I think for a long time it required a centralized entity um, to, to run these things because it required so much upfront cost. I don't think you would have built the internet or the telecom system with an agile, you know, uh, approach, a lean startup methodology, you know, breaking it down into pieces. It required a big waterfall approach um, mm -hmm. to building these things. And as a result, we're now where we are. But now that we've got the infrastructure, we're realizing that now we have more of a peer to peer or anything to anything or everything to everything. I've heard different buzzwords, E to E, A to A, IOT, all this, all this kind of um, management speak and consultants. And now we're talking about distributing it. We can only do that because of all the initial investment that came in. And so I think a lot of people are saying like decentralize all the things. The actual original quote, um, that that comes from is from an early episode of Let's Talk Bitcoin, and it was decentralized things that can be centralized. Everything that can be centralized will be centralized. That's it. That's the quote. Um, so it wasn't quite, I don't think, the, the sort of the radical extremist approach uh, that everyone is, is saying. I don't think that anyone in this community, apart from the most extreme elements, are saying that everything should be decentralized. But when we see things like this, where I'm showing a link to the Mashable website. Um, Janine has just pulled it up for us in the private chat. Inside the black market where people pay thousands of dollars for Instagram verifications. And apparently this isn't just true for Instagram, but it's also true on Twitter as well, where the, the, there's turned out that there's a way that you can pay to get that blue tick. And the blue tick, and a lot of you may not know this, gives you extra features, right? It actually gives you access to the different features on the platform allows you to curate your content, allows you to filter out all the trolls, for example. Um, they're called the blue ticks, apparently. The blue ticks, I'm being told. And as a result, people, people are seeking them out. The other thing about the blue tick is that people are more likely to follow you. Because if you've got a blue tick next to your name, well, it must mean something good about you, right? Um, and so I, I feel like, yeah, we do we do need to kind of decentralize a lot of this stuff. And I think it's correct that we shouldn't be putting uh, identity in raw form on the blockchain. But do remember that even if you're putting hashes on any kind of blockchain entity, it's Horizon Coin or whatever, Florin Coin, all these other, you know, semi-scammy type of projects, is that if somebody hacks the company that's using that as a hash table, that's using it as a lookup, all they all they have to do then is use this as a key value pair and they can instantly see you know when you committed this to the blockchain exactly what data is sitting behind that that cryptographic hash function don't think that just because it's being hashed and put on a blockchain that the company that's hashing it for you will not be hacked at some point in the future or be bought out acquisitions and mergers happen all the time so I, I think what we're talking about is like an open source reputation system. There may be centralized versions and centralized entities that sit on top of that um, so that, that there can be like a secret source, like a black box behind it. But we're talking about an open source system where everyone understands the rules, the rules of that system and everyone can participate in that system. And more importantly, that you then own your own data. You're then able to export it. If Twitter goes down or decides to censor you, you can export that data. You can take those maybe those followers with you, uh, maybe a lot of that content you can take with you, and then import it into another platform, uh, basically making it extensible and interoperable, according to the Unix philosophy. See, Namecoin has had a lot of interesting features um, in that regard. It's that like that project is so underrated. But in addition to the whole DNS aspect of it, there were actually some small segments to um, 
pretty much try to protocolize uh, social media where you could kind of register a basic um, profile on the blockchain in the same way you would uh, your DNS record and then kind of cement that so you would have like your name, like very basic information and then the key to access that and kind of build up uh, off of that. But nobody actually went and did anything with it. I know that um, uh, the guys from uh, one name, uh, what are they called again? Uh, Blockstack nowadays. Um, they had basically their whole system running on one uh, on Namecoin at first. But they did a big transition to Bitcoin in, I think it was 2015, maybe last year. Uh, but they also wrote a write about like the reasons why they switched from Namecoin to Bitcoin. Um, and personally, I think that there are more efficient ways to do it, like DNS itself, for example. I've never had an issue with being censored on by a root server <laughs> or something like that. And like even if root servers would become an issue because let's say uh, hypothetically the US government would intervene in one way or the other um, and they would try something then it's fairly easy to route around them and you know I think that people there was a quote retweeted by Adam Beck a couple of months ago by someone else who said uh, the internet routes around censorship as if they are damaged goods and I think that's entirely true um, you yeah, can see that it income. does slow it does slow things down. I mean, look at BTC for example. I mean, they've lost their dot com, and at any point the the U.S. government could just pull the plug, right? Because it mm -hmm. owns most of that infrastructure. Right. No, that's a good point. But at the same time, um, you see it with like attacks on the Bitcoin network. At the same time, in general, it makes the network itself stronger, more resilient to similar types of attacks in the future. Um, so there's a dichotomy to probably everything. Um, yeah, and that's also here that you're looking for efficiency both like cost and risk efficiency so when you would go for pure cost efficiency you would probably want to use dns um, and if you want to go for the most risk efficient solution you would probably go for like the most secure blockchain and uh, try to decentralize it that way but you're always not specifically looking for a middle ground but each use case has its own demands and wishes and you always have to um well, there's always a trade-off between usability and security. Yeah. Or cost yeah. efficiency. Yeah, we talked about Zuku's famous triangle on this show before. And All right. It's uh, so much entertainment. <laughs> but what, I want to know what you make of this whole Equifax saga as well, because we saw you know, a large centralized database of 140 million people, roughly half the US population, the adult population, have all their private identifiable information taken in this hack, who may not have understood that this entity actually possessed all that information about them right because the, you go for a bank account you sign up for a credit card you don't you don't read all the small print where it says we're going to share this with the these third parties you just kind of say yeah because i need a credit card i need credit i need to this whole economy runs on credit so of course i need it and then you don't understand that the other downside to doing it even if you pay it off every month is you're still giving away your personal information, which has become a form of oil, really, in, in this uh, startup space, right? Like companies are using your private identifiable information as a currency. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's probably the problem worldwide. So um, not only for Equifax, but this whole world still works with PII because, you know, that's how we've always done it. Uh, but as with credit cards, the internet was not designed for credit cards and neither for personally identifiable information. Um, so we need we need better solutions for that. And I personally believe that key signing can suffice in most of the use cases, if not all, uh, that you not, don't necessarily need a blockchain. Of course, they there might be advantages there. But you want to be if you want to be risk efficient, you got to keep in mind that do you really want your reputation out there on the blockchain? Is it in any form revocable or so to speak? Can you ever make up for a mistake that you made in the past? So the solution here is not putting 143 million people's rep identity and reputation on the blockchain. Um, because then again, you have a single point of failure. And if there's like a, a bug in the code or something else, you know, eventually it might be traced back and then all the data is public. So that's why I'm not a big fan of, um, of those type of solutions and why I believe that key signing can actually suffice here. Because if a company like Equifax simply 
uh, signs a statement that I uh, that I repaid my last loan in time, for example, then that's all they need to do. If I show that to somebody else, they can check the signature, they can verify it against their public uh, against their public key, and if it matches out, then what else do they need to know about me? They know that I paid. You know, I could maybe. Uh, of course, Equifax will sign my pub key. You know, I can prove that I'm the controller of my pub key with my own priv key. So you can make it pretty much 